This is Defender Radio. Defender Radio is brought to you by the Association for the Protection of Fur-Bearing Animals. the week of February 20th, 2017, and this is Michael Howie welcoming you to episode 417 of Defender Radio. What happens when you put 20 international scientists in a room for two days to talk about human wildlife conflict resolution? You get the seven principles for ethical wildlife control. The BCSPCA and UBC's Animal Welfare Program, funded by the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies, hosted a two-day workshop in 2015, which brought together scientists from around the world to look at these subjects from an international perspective. Out of this workshop came the seven principles for ethical wildlife control. The paper, which was published this month in the journal Conservation Biology under the title International Consensus Principles for Ethical Wildlife Control, and is publicly available, does not focus on a single ethical standpoint or biological function to determine effective ethical control. It is, according to the authors, the first paper that poses several points to create a framework for control and conflict resolution. It can be boiled down to several questions. Can the problem be mitigated by changing human behavior? Are the harms serious enough to warrant wildlife control? Is the desired outcome clear and achievable, and will it be monitored? Does the proposed method carry the least animal welfare cost and to the fewest animals? Have community values been considered alongside scientific, technical, and practical information? Is the control action part of a systematic long-term management program? Are the decisions warranted by the specifics of the situation rather than the negative labels applied to the animals? To discuss why we need a framework for ethical decision-making in wildlife conflict, how these principles apply in various circumstances, and what a rollout of these guidelines could look like, Defender Radio is joined by co-author of the paper and chief scientific officer at the BCSBCA, Dr. Sarah Dubois. You are a co-author on the new report, International Consensus Principles for Ethical Wildlife Control. It's a a very interesting read that was published in uh, Conservation Biology, Uh, just in the last several days, and it all came from a two-day conference. So why don't we start out, uh, can you tell us a bit about the the conference uh, that led to this paper? Yes, so the expert forum for wildlife control was held at the University of British Columbia in July 2015, and it was co-hosted by the BCSPCA and the UBC Animal Welfare Program. And we had received some funding for a specialized project to look into humane and ethical wildlife control practices from the Peter Wall Institute. And this was an opportunity to really look at what is happening internationally in terms of wildlife control practices, where there is um, some successes, where there are some failures, and to learn from the experiences of our colleagues across the world. And thankfully, this grant enabled us to bring them to British Columbia to host this meeting. And it was just on the week of Compassionate Conservation Conference. So it was a great timing and everyone was able to participate in in both those events. And we're just very thankful that we actually were able to reach consensus from a very broad and diverse group of individuals who have conservation, animal welfare, and ethics backgrounds, and, and practitioners, too. So it was very exciting to work on this project. Well, and it is interesting, too, uh, because I do see there's at least one person here who appears to be sort of a government employee for New Zealand, uh, Ministry for Primary Industries, Regulation and Assurance. So I imagine that is not quite the same as the head of research for an SPCA. Like, that sounds like a, a very different part uh, of the the spectrum of animal welfare discussion. Absolutely. I think, thankfully, the common thread here was that we were all scientists and we were coming from different fields of inquiry and work. So some are working on policy. There were other individuals who actually work in the field on a day-to-day basis on control activities, uh, academics, as well as vet- a veterinarian and researchers who are doing wonderful research to try to improve humaneness of control methods, for example. And that's sort of where this, this, this paper starts. Um, in the introduction, sort of looking at how currently wildlife is managed in relation specifically to conflict. Um, and as it's very 
quickly pointed, uh, non-lethal or lethal means through exclusion, trapping, hunting, poisoning, or otherwise destroying animals. And uh, while I am not familiar with what the numbers are, my impression is that lethal is much more prevalent than non-lethal these days. Absolutely. Uh, is that sort of a, yeah, yeah that's a, maybe a consensus around the globe? Yes, yeah, so definitely lethal measures are often the default for some of these populations of wild animals because they are often a common species. So they're not held in the same regard in policy and legislation or in moral value as some of the more rare and endangered species. And often really inhumane methods have been justified because these animals are common or because they've been labeled as pests in the areas that they are found. And they could be native species like kangaroos. You know, they have, that's the main control issue in Australia. Um, it's not necessarily all non-native or introduced species that are being targeted by control efforts, but there really needs to be a, a lens that you need to look at these projects through which, you know, the, the long-term objectives of these projects are often eradication, but that's never really achievable when you're doing small uh you know, poorly funded uh, control efforts that are needless suffering at the end of the day. And that is something, and I, I, I believe you might have actually cited the same study that I'm thinking of. They found uh, in the United States in one study that even when 70% of a coyote population was removed uh, through lethal control, within two years, that population had rebounded. Um, and one would presume, based on that information, that you have not solved any actual problems by trying to control the population. None whatsoever. It's absolutely census killing in that you know, particular example. And we've seen that in British Columbia where there have been deer calls or geese calls. And it really just amounts to a, a significant expense that does not alter the root cause of why those animals are in that area. And it actually has really little justification often for why, why are we even killing these animals? You know, you might be able to find a method that is appropriate and is going to be quick and uh, painless, but that just doesn't mean that this is actually going to work at the end of the day in terms of actually achieving the goal of what the control method, you know, objectives are. Yeah. And that's, a, I, I like the way this is laid out, so I'm just kind of going to walk through the study, I think, that, uh, as, as we talk a bit. And you move into modifying human practices. And there's a, a wonderful statement here. Um, uh, a first response to human-wildlife conflict should be to focus on how human behavior has affected the ecosystem and address the root causes of conflict rather than only the problematic problematic outcome. Um, how the, To me, this the, the, I... I you, you know what I write about and what I talk about. And I feel like I'm hitting my head against a brick wall because almost every time we talk about conflict, we talk about attractance, we talk about development, we talk, like it's the same things. Yeah, um, absolutely. What do we need to do to maybe, and, and I don't think it's necessarily even modifying human practices, but really showing people or illustrating that it is human practices that lead to most of this conflict. Well, I think that there's this, often this assumption that, you know, we can just treat the symptoms of problems and that we, if we continue to do that, we'll eventually make some headway. And in this case, that means killing animals. And that's just, in you know, the realization that we, we really don't have this domination over all, you know, animal kind and have justification to, to kill them because they're, they become a problem as a result of our actions in the first place. And this was actually a really debated, you know, principle among our group. Uh, so it, everyone found that it was valuable, but where do we put it in, in this kind of stepwise uh, list of principles? So should it be the last principle? Should it be in the middle? Should it be first? Because you really have to think of what are we trying to accomplish at the end of the day in terms of the goals and objectives of the control. And we really did come to the realization that actually we need to recognize we are the problem first and foremost. People, humans are the problem. And that it's as a result of our actions that the control uh, symptoms are developing. So I think that it's it's just you know unfortunately it's a long term education process but I think if 
again, these projects are looked at with a lens of like, can I do something alternative? To, you know, the control doesn't mean just killing animals. Control means I, you know, modifying my approach to managing a wildlife population, and maybe that's looking at habitat or looking at attractants before we even talk about moving or touching or killing these animals. You write that justifying control requires reconciling perceived and real harms and conflicting values. Again, this these are things I feel like we, we sort of collectively in the animal welfare world and, and for, for you and your peers in the wildlife sciences, it's things we talk about. And I know ultimately this this is one of the, the wonderful parts of this paper that you, you actually highlight yourself is that this is one of the first times all of this has been put in one place. Um, but talking about are these problems actually causing harm? Yeah. Um, and that's, I think, a, a great example of that is for, uh, you know, deer eating gardens. Yes. It's frustrating, but is it actually causing any kind of real harm? Yes. And that's really, the deer example is a really great one because there are, there are examples uh, on every kind of level of perceived or real harm. So, of course, we've heard real challenges with Lyme disease and chronic wasting disease, but they're in very distinct areas, and, and British Columbia is not one of those situations, for example. But then we have this idea of too many deer in a downtown city location because of gardens. So is that a real problem, or is that just a perception that um, there are more deer uh, you know, now? And how we actually measured that is, is that uh, uh, something that is actual, you know, science that can be documented? Or is it just talk and rumors about the perceived notion of conflict? And then you can have situations where you're on a very, very small island and the deer themselves are at risk because they're eating themselves off the island. And they, they don't have the browsing uh, capacity and their population is going unchecked because there's no predators. So there are some rare circumstances where there is justification for control, but being able to really describe what the justification is, not just because they exist. So just because those animals are there and people don't like them doesn't mean that there is a, a justification uh, for control measures. And, and I think, you know, when you look at environmental impact assessments and, you know, they have to go through this detailed process of saying, you know, can we put in, you know, a, a, a road here, for example, and they have to ensure that all the checks and balances have, have gone through. This is the same type of assessment. Can you control an animal uh, population? Is there even a need to or what other measures can be taken? And, and we have to look at that at the same level of critique uh, and justification is, is a big part of that. There's, in this section, uh, justification for control in the paper, you use three different terms, and some of them are new to me, although they are not new ideas. None of these are new ideas. Um, I, I, sh I should preface that. But you talk about carrying capacity, biological carrying capacity, cultural carrying capacity, and the concept of um, assessments of overabundance being subjective. So biological carrying capacity is what you kind of learn in that grade 10, grade 12 science about, you know, that K, how much can the environment support? How many animals can live here based on the resources that are available to them? And so that is very different from what cultural carrying capacity is, and that is what people will tolerate in an area. So it's not based on how many animals can live there, based on how much food and is available and habitat is available to them, but what will people tolerate? And we see these in studies a lot of the time in, in recreation and parks because a lot of surveys are done in those areas with people who are visiting and they'll ask them, you know, people's level of comfort with having bears in the area, wolves in the area, you know, deer in the area. So th there is a way to measure cultural carrying capacity, which is basically people's tolerance for animals. And that's can be influenced on how people perceive, and that's very subjective, as to whether animals are overabundant or not. Again, you can measure biologically if animals are overabundant. There's too many on a small island. It's pretty easy to measure. But to think that, you know, in a, in a city area when you see five deer in a day, are we actually able to measure if those are the same deer? Where are they moving? How, what's, what's the habitat that they're using? Is there enough? Is, is it just that I don't you know, like deer and I don't want to 
see them on a frequent basis in my backyard. That's those are very different things. So again, that subjectivity really needs to be accounted for. Well, and and regarding the subjectivity, that's something that I I personally see as a source of conflict in political discourse on wildlife control and wildlife planning. Uh, I think a, a great example is uh, grizzly bears in British Columbia. Um, as we talk about saying, you know, we have we have concerns about population counts and we have concerns about the ethical treatment and all, all of these other elements, we then see people, um, whether they are land users or maybe not involved, but still sort of putting in their, their opinion, saying, I see more grizzly bears than I do moose. Therefore, we should be killing the grizzly bears and doing something to help the moose stop talking about grizzly bears. And this is something... Well, in this you, case, there's very few moose, unfortunately, anymore in British Columbia as well. So that's uh, an interesting thing. But yeah, just just because, you know, the seeing animals um, and, you know, maybe at a different time, if you had, a, if you had an experience, a negative experience with a, a deer, maybe, you, you know, you had a traffic accident with one, your perception of any deer in the area is going to be very different for someone who has had no experience with deer as well. It's almost a type of confirmation bias then. Yes. Yes, exactly. Okay, that's that's good to keep in mind when that comes up. Um, that's sort of the red car syndrome that we talk about in marketing yes. class. Um, <laughs> yeah, if you drive a red car, yeah, you're going to be more likely to see red cars. Um, and measurement, I feel, is something that is very difficult. And this, this plays into much of the rest of these points. Uh, Decision-making by specifics rather than labels, systemic planning, um, animal welfare, etc., is trying to actually measure some of these things. And again, this is where we get into that discussion. Uh, as listeners know, my my sort of source for this is going to be urban conflict and, and um, livestock depredation, particularly with coyotes, where my interests have been and where much of my reading has been. And when you talk to someone, for example, Louise Leibenberg um, of the Grazier Ranch in High Prairie, Alberta, who is an advocate for livestock guardian dogs, and she says, we don't know how many animals are actually killed by depredation. We don't know how many coyotes are killed. We like there, There's all of this information we don't know. But we're spending time and money and social policy to keep doing these things. Mm-hmm. Even though we don't have the data to know is if it it's happening. The, yeah. yeah, well, not even is it working, but is it happening the way we're being told it's happening? Absolutely. I think that measurement is is key, yes. So how do we maybe start approaching that uh, uh, on a consistent level and explain, like, if you want to go out and protect your livestock or if you want to limit the number of deer in an area, we need to know how many, uh, you know, coyotes there are, what other measures you've done, and uh, uh, what the, the actual, you know, birth rates are. And then we also need to know how many deer there are in an area. Um, how do we approach that concept to the public? Well, and that's where we've really articulated that in one of the principles, one of the seven principles is, you know, these clear and objective achievable outcomes. Because if you don't know how many animals are in a population and you're going to remove a specific number, just, you know, we've seen this with, you know, cats in, in, in New Zealand, they propose, in Australia, they propose moving, removing 2 million feral cats from the environment. Well, that doesn't mean a whole lot if we don't know how many cats are out there um, in the first place. So is that, uh, is there even 2 million out there? Is that going to make any real difference for, for the depredation of wildlife? So I think that measurement is key, and that's what makes actually you know, it should be a requirement of control practices. Again, if we are using these seven steps as kind of that assessment as to whether or not control should happen, that is where scientists and academics and also policymakers should be ensuring that any good control practice is actually going through all of these steps. Animal welfare is a science because it can be measured. You can measure pain and suffering in animals. You know, you don't have to uh, ask them, like people in the hospital, to rate, you know, a happy or sad face uh, as to what their pain experience is, but you can actually measure biologically their pain and suffering. So we know that. We can measure populations or at least do predictive modeling of large populations that can't every animal, where every animal can't be counted. So to just put out there that, you know what, we're going to go out there and we're going to call 250 geese 
when the estimated population is potentially over 10,000, you know, again, that is is really a, uh, not a science-based policy. That's really just, uh, you know, perhaps a politically motivated policy. And, and we have to really call out those types of control projects. And ideally, how would you like to see this then roll out? Uh, you, you have the seven principles or seven questions that can be asked um, regarding human-wildlife conflicts to ensure that the principles are followed. And you, you have uh, the discussion of what is ethical. I know one thing that you have talked a lot about, and, and I'm still yet to get a clear answer from anyone, is what is humane. <laughs> um, how do you see then this concept, this this what I, I would consider a very significant first step maybe into a new way of doing wildlife conflict resolution. Um, what do you see as the, the way we move forward with all of these different pieces? And that's the question we asked of the attendees at this expert forum. So to have, you know, 20 international representatives from government and NGOs, from conservation organizations, animal welfare organizations, um, come up with this seven set of principles, you know, our intention was like, we actually need this to be used. We just don't want to put out ideas and concepts and, you know, rejig some other old ideas. We actually want them to be applied. So we think that they could be incorporated into international standards. And, for example, the World Organization for Animal Health has sets of standards for, for example, management of feral dog populations. And so the same type of thing in a wildlife control setting could be applied into international standards. But they could also inform either local government or provincial government uh, guidelines. Um, universities could use them as you know, checks and balances for research projects. So any research project that's going to be proposed at the university has to go through a, an animal care committee, for example. They're evaluating very specific um, things, but they're not looking at all these seven different requirements. So again, we really wanted to make this uh, applied and, and functional for any type of assessment of whether or not control is necessary. And, and we're using it in the development of an accreditation program at the BCSPCA for wildlife and rodent control businesses, for example. I think to finish, something I'd like to ask, and this is potentially one of those annoying questions that we can't actually get a straight answer to, is why does this matter? To and and not to to those like yourself who are uh, both compassionate and also involved in the science in in seeking to improve constantly, um, or to myself as just a, a sort of straightforward advocate, but to the day to day Canadian uh, or to the world citizen who doesn't deal with some of these issues on a regular basis. Why is this kind of discussion, these kinds of solutions, so important moving forward? Well, that's a really great question. And I have to frame it as, why would my dad care about this? <laughs> you know, he's not necessarily an animal person. He's, you know, maybe a little conservative versus his daughter. And he would wonder, why would this matter? And I would say, you know what, tax dollars are being used to conduct control programs. So at a very basic level of your money is going to be used uh, to kill animals. And whether or not that is a good use of funding um, should be evaluated on many different levels. And whether or not, you know, the, the actual effectiveness of the program, how many times it's going to have to be repeated, how much more money is it going to cost, is it useless money because the problem, like you said, with the coyotes is just going to come back in two years. So, you know, at the very uh, non-animal but, you know, conscientious uh, financial Canadian, that might, that might be the rationale. But it's also about wildlife being owned by all Canadians that we have a responsibility as Canadians to ensure that wildlife is here for many generations. And to be irresponsible with the lives of these animals and to, to not really put any forethought into these programs, which are, are quite costly, um, I think is, is just completely irresponsible. And I would hope that any sensible you know, accountant, lawyer, business person would, would also see that you know, there is a cost-benefit analysis that needs to go into these projects. And how to really do that thoroughly is using these principles. 
To learn more about the work of Dr. Sarah Dubois and the BCSPCA, visit bcspca.ca. To read the paper, follow the links on this week's Defender Radio blog at thefurbears.com. That's it for this week. Until next time, this is Michael Howie for Defender Radio, reminding you to stay informed and stay strong.